Buenas noches. A welcome to uh, this wonderful Centro event. We have a magnificent panel ready for you. This is a second of various events that we're going to have this semester. But this is a very special uh, event in, uh, uh, for me. We, this is a, a, a unit that we created not too long ago, about a year or so, uh, to really push uh, the area of oral histories. Now, for those of you who actually know the field of oral histories, I should say two words without preempting all the speeches that we're going to, all the analysis that we're going to hear in a minute. But um, oral histories have different purposes. That's how the Central Archive started, with collecting the memories of people about migration way back, uh, about maybe 35 years ago. Shortly after uh, Central was created 41 years ago, this, uh, the first exercise of collecting primary data was about oral history. So we, ha we have oral histories that date back to then. And we have different formats, different medium, and so forth. But this particular project of oral histories reserve a very special place in our archival collections. And, and that's because it's, it was linked to the, the 100 Puerto Ricans campaign. It was an effort to really uh, fill some of the gaps that we thought we had in our collections on the one hand. But on the other hand, was intended, and they're going to explain all about this, the protocol, the methodology, and all that was intended to accelerate the acquisition process for collections. It was intended to also provide uh, a, a kind of an interpretation of that collection that these people, uh, these wonderful people donate to the center of, to, uh, uh, to our custody, uh, was intended to have a voice that explains that collection that is unique to the donor, him or herself. And that's what this project is all about. And they're going to tell you all about those details. So it's not just uh, 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 one more oral history project. It's an oral history that has a central uh, mission within the archives, the central archives. And it's a, it's a, I think it's a very novel approach to start a collection through this door. Uh, because from the beginning, you have a narrative about how those people see their life and how they interpret what their contributions are. And then comes the documents and the photos and everything else, uh, digitization, and we have all recorded. So they're going to tell you all about it. So we have a distinguished panelist on my, on my far left, Cynthia Tover, who's now assistant professor of library sciences. Uh, we have uh, Chatki Castro, who is our coordinator of oral histories. And we have um, uh, a professor from uh, uh, este, a scholarship of Staten Island, right, right, right. And my very dear friend, uh, uh, in any case, we are uh, uh, recording live, live streaming, so we have to start uh, promptly, and I wish you all well. But in any case, uh, I think who's going to speak first, Ismael or, or Cynthia? Let me introduce them. Okay, Ismael is going to introduce, so with, with you is Maria Garcia. Thank you. Hi, uh, good evening. Since the 1970s, uh, central staff began using oral history as an alternative to mainstream uh, research methodologies. The practice of oral history offers the un unofficial version from workers women, minorities, and community leaders that official records and manuscripts cannot offer. In the 1980s, the Oral History Task Force emerged as a multidisciplinary unit within Centro. Uh, this unit carried out projects such as Puerto Ricans in New York, uh, Voices of the Migration, and extended routes from Hawaii to New York. Later, from, two, from the year 2000 to 2001, uh, I had the privilege uh, to be part of Central's uh, Hispanic Labor Documentation Project, which collected oral histories of Latinas and Latinos in uh, the New York City labor 
movement. Following this tradition, today's panel will introduce us to Memorias, uh, Centro's uh, current oral history project. Uh, what I want to emphasize is that scholars of Puerto Rican studies share the use of oral history with public historians, uh, archivists, librarians, anthropologists like me, uh, and other people outside of uh, the formal academic uh, discipline of history. And the panelists uh, share uh, this uh, disciplinary uh, boundaries, if we could say. Uh, they are librarians and uh, public uh, historians. So the first panelist is uh, Cynthia Tovar, uh, former Centro's uh, project archivist and archivist as at uh, Bronx Community College. So thank you everyone for coming. We're so glad to finally be presenting on Centro's current oral history project, which has been going on for about a year and a half to two years. It was originally envisioned as a push for more archival collections, as Dr. Melendez told us, in order to celebrate Centro's 40th anniversary. And it's grown exponentially beyond that. We have almost 300 people on our list of candidates to interview from a humble amount of 100 Puerto Ricans, which was the original working name of this project. And we're going to share some clips with you tonight. This is sort of a new approach to oral history and archival gathering. These oral histories are meant to function as a sort of digital finding aid to the collections that we hope to add to Centro's archive. And I'm gonna let Cynthia show you some clips and talk about them. Okay, great, okay. thanks. All right. So since I was brought onto the project previously managing and uh, helping guide the work that was already started by Sarah Molinari and Shakti Castro, who are also part of the panel, and who will be speaking a little bit more about the background to oral history, what it is for those of you who aren't familiar with the field. But how I kind of got started with oral history was basically a uh, very uh, down-to-earth uh, uh, seal to document the history of an activist organization that I was a part of back when I was an undergrad uh, student here in this very campus at Hunter College. I was a member of the Welfare Rights Initiative, which is a student grassroots organization here at Hunter College that helps guide and empower welfare recipient college students to stay in school and help them guide them through the financial crisis that they experience, as well as trying to stay in school and deal with guaranteeing that they have their benefits while they stay in school. And being part of that legislative action a few years ago, uh, I, as being trained as an archivist, was wondering what had ever happened to the organization and if anybody was documenting its history. And no one had been. And as a former member of the organization, I took it upon myself. I got some grant funding back when I was a professor at a different CUNY campus. And I started this project from scratch, just basically learning as I go and getting a lot of feedback from uh, public historians and oral historians at the Graduate Center, such as Steve Breyer, who's also the head of the doctoral program in urban ed at the Graduate Center, and reaching out to colleagues at Columbia's uh, Center for Oral History. Back then, it was the Office of Oral History. And I started documenting these stories, uh, specifically uh, talking about uh, their first uh, person narrative accounts of having to deal with the stigma of being a welfare recipient, of having to deal with wanting to get a college education to stay in school, and getting their stories, and bringing a sense of social awareness to the issues surrounding welfare and its effects on those who wanted an equal access to education, not necessarily special, but equal access. And how WRI, Welfare Rights Initiative, was created to help them uh, to get actively involved with policy making and empowering them to be their own best advocates. And so I started this archive. I collected about 14 interviews, of which eight are available online for people to listen to and to give them that equal access to. Uh, the only thing you would need to do to learn more about the organization is just have an internet connection, have access to a computer or through your smartphone or through any kind of a device and have access to these first narrative accounts. So I already had kind of like this, and that's kind of just got me started with becoming uh, fixated and fascinated with oral history. It's a predominantly, uh, uh, for folklorists, I mean, uh, you could take it as far back as the WPA era in regards to how the government itself had funded a lot of these documentation efforts, documenting, again, 
Uh, it may not be a factual uh, retelling of what happened, a historical event, but that first person narrative account, that storytelling element uh, is in fact very historical and very pertinent and very important and it's compelling to many people to hear how somebody lived through a certain historical experience. So since then I got involved with other types of oral history documentation and with my archival background I was able to try to combine the digital with the oral history component and meet a lot of fascinating people along the way, the people at the Occupy Wall Street movement. We started an archives working group and within that, their ranks we started an oral history component where we were interviewing the occupiers right there at the scene of the protest and getting their first person narratives. So uh, not only looking at it from an archival standpoint being, okay, you receive these interviews and now it's your job to preserve them and make them accessible, but also kind of switching seats and being the producer and uh, calling the shots and saying, I feel this historical event, uh, event or happening is worth documenting. And this kind of do-it-yourself approach is kind of what appealed to me about oral history and my own oral history work. So then I had this wonderful opportunity to work with Central uh, for the uh, 100 Puerto Ricans uh, project campaign and now being called Memorias and essentially again taking the everyday stories of so-called ordinary people or uh, extraordinary people and the extraordinary ways that they contribute to their community. I have a few clips here. Let's see. I think I'd like to start with, I guess we were asked to talk about like what themes would we think were pertinent throughout the, our time working on the project. And for me, obviously, with my activist background, I thought the community building, the social justice and activist aspects of the stories that we were collecting. And I noticed there was a thread of that with all the stories that we were collecting. I wanted to start with Milagros O'Toole. Let's see, there are two clips here, and I think it's only one. Okay. So let's see where we're at with this. A little bit about Milagros Baez O'Toole. Uh, she was born in San Germán, Puerto Rico, and she came to New York City with her family in the early 50s. And she served on several executive boards and essentially has a very long history of serving a civil service background, of giving back to the community. And uh, throughout her interview, she talks about her civic service that spans over 35 years and how she served as a deputy commissioner for administration and planning services at various New York City government agencies, including the Department of Probation, the Human Resources, Resources Administration, and Department of General Services. And she was the first woman in Puerto Rican appointed by Cuomo to the position of Deputy Commissioner for Operations for New York State's Office of General Services when she served from 86 to 95. I really feel that uh, uh, we have so many problems in the world that everybody's responsibility to have. Because it's not smart mental health. And we can't continue in the world with some of the things that need to be changed. I'm not saying the world is all bad. I see a lot of goodness in the world. But there's some things that need to be changed. And whether or not you have the ability to change them, they're saying that uh, people say you have to be a lawyer to change them. No, <laughs> lawyers can't change that. People need to change that. And you, you be the part of the solution and be part of the problem. And if you, I think, um, I was going to say if you have a family, but not necessarily. So, you know, I think most people want to do something about changing whatever is wrong in the community, in the world, whatever. And that's saying that we don't have a lot of good things. I think we need to look at the good things, otherwise, you know, you miss them. And uh, I, I think this is a beautiful world. I'm not just saying that I really, you know, I see a lot of beer. I love New York. I can't believe that with so many parks and so many wonderful things to enjoy in New York. Uh, but I also see that there's a lot of problems in New York. And so how could you live and just enjoy the good things and not try to help in your own way? I mean, you don't have to give a lot of money. You don't have to do that. But then on the other hand, I'll tell you. So some of us are sitting here, and we're retired. And some of us, let's say, that had the advantages of uh, uh, being at the right place at the right time. And we had the opportunity to have good position and to have good retirements and have uh, maybe a little money in the bank. And so. You have children, you help your children, but you know how much money do you need to live? How much money do you need in the bank? How much money do you need to keep that you feel that you can let people go with needs? So I think it's an individual thing, and I think you have to think about it for yourself. People can't force you to do anything. 
But I think that if you don't think about it, you wouldn't know how you feel. And so I believe that, um, I believe in being wise about your money, but uh, I would rather die knowing that I did good things in the world than die rich. <laughs> So, and my husband feels the same way, and my children know it, and uh, my children, we talk about it, and uh, you know, you, you develop and you grow assets and you have assets and you, you know, if you had a good life, and I talk about it, I said, well, you know, this is the way it's going to be, we need to, and, and you know, I, I'm, I'm proud to say that my children are of the same mind, they really are of the same mind. And that, to me, I can't, it, I can't even begin to describe to you the number of interviews that we've done. And if you go through the database, and once these interviews will become publicly accessible, you keep seeing this theme pop up again and again and again in your own small way. In one of the interviews that we had with uh, 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 Professor Carasquillo, Angela Carasquillo from Fordham University, she talks about her humble beginnings, uh, being in a small village and how they wouldn't have enough to eat and all it would take would be the neighbors making a pot of rice and bringing that pot of rice to their door without even having to be asked. Those small uh, sentiments, those small uh, emo emotions that people take for granted. It starts very locally, it starts very small, but those things start to build up. And that was something that I thought stood out particularly well, especially not m just amongst Latinos, but within the Puerto Ricans that we interviewed for this project, it just kept on coming back again and again and again. I succeeded, I struggled, I fought, I had to work really hard, I had people who were standing against me, but then I had all these people helping me and not leaving the door closed on the way out, like just leaving the door open for those to come back after you. This notion of altruism and everyday heroism and how inspirational it could be starting off very small to very big actions and I thought that stood out very big and yes she's uh, runs the 100 Hispanic women organization and she's a leader in her field and community but then you have uh, other uh, people who we interviewed for the project Tony Ruiz who's a runner just a runner but he just also happens to be the first Puerto Rican running coach of the Central Park Track Club, and he had a very poignant story. I mean, his background, he talked about his experiences having been a coach, but he had also, in the 1980s, uh, had been a, a nominee to be on the Olympic uh, team going to Munich, but then due to a personal setback, could not make it, and how that kind of personal setback kind of set him back a few years and prevented him from uh, fulfilling his uh, dreams for Olympic gold as a runner. And for anybody who has been just that close to having one of those turning points happen in your life, you'll understand that these are pretty significant moments. But sure, he had some setbacks, but then he also had a lot of people in his life who came in and guided him and helped him out of that funk and helped him propel himself. And he went on to Iona College on a partial scholarship. He never quite finished uh, college. He only went on a partial scholarship and he was able to uh, participate as a runner on their team. But again, as a runner, thinking about uh, community, again, that sense of community building, that sense of uh, wanting to give back. And even though he may not be on the board, he may not have an official title, even in his own small way, wanting to give back. And in this clip, uh, he talks about his participation in uh, the program Mentors of Distinction uh, to help inner city youth and uh, about character building. So let's see if this clip works. It'll work. I hope it does, because it's a really good clip. And he's wearing that George Westinghouse uh, high school uh, t-shirt he wears with pride. Uh, that was part of his high school track uh, team. So I knew that we had this connection. And uh, I always knew that there was something special. You know, when you meet somebody and 27 years, and it's like he's really the only person that I, that I stayed in touch with uh, at the Housing Authority. And so Irving, uh, said, you know, we have this group and we're trying to, we're trying to uh, get together uh, and be black mentors, you know, for our community. And uh, I said, really? I said, man, I would love to do that. I got a little, little time now, you know, maybe I could get involved. And he says, well, you, you're obviously the one guy that I, that I want to sponsor and so you can be a part of the group. So, uh, so now um, I am 
a member of Mentors of Distinction. I, I was just accepted. And uh, uh, one of our, our missions uh, is to obviously mentor in the inner city. Uh, most of the guys, uh, I think right now we have uh, 12 members. And all of these uh, members are people who have uh, professionals, uh, well-educated, African-American, uh, Puerto Rican, you know, <clears throat> Hispanic. And um, so we basically are just want to be role models, you know. And I know that we saw the other days, I, I saw where, um, where the president talked about what we were lacking in this country. And one of the biggest things was that in the inner cities, we're lacking mentors. You know, a lot of these African American and minority kids, you know, people that have um, really no chance. You know, I mean, I, I had a chance, but it was only because people came to help me, man. I mean, you know, I wouldn't have made it out of East New York, Alphabet City, you know, without the help of all these people in my life. You know, all these people that came at an early stage, you know, and even and even some of them didn't come at an early stage. They came later on, but they got me in time, you know, um, when I was 14, 15 years old, 20 years old even, you know. And um, so so now with the Mentors of Distinction, um, one of the programs that we're trying to put together is, uh, is that we each, we're, we're each going to have like mentees. Uh, go into the inner city communities. We're gonna um, uh, get some funding, or at least you know, put in for for the, some of the funding that the president uh, is making an allotment to, because he he he, he talked about this uh, probably about a month ago, um, and it's great that he's thinking in this way because you know I know some people. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm not big into politics, you know, for a lot of reasons in my life, but um, I do feel that, that that particular program is something that has to be done. It has to be done in this country, and a, and a group like Mentors of Distinction, we can take advantage of that and, and give back and do so many positive things. Like, they've already assigned me to track coach, and we're going to, one of the things that we'll probably do is, uh, is, get, is try to get a track team, uh, you know, Mentor the distinction track team, uh, that, that kind of thing. But um, however we do it, um, I, I know that from that perspective, I'll, I'll be involved in that. Uh, and there are a bunch of other things that we're discussing right now. Um, and, and so if you look on Facebook and you uh, see MOD, like our homepage, Mentor the Distinction, and, uh, and then you're welcome to also, uh, you know, uh, send me any type of, um, messages on Facebook if you want to be a part of that. Had to do that plug-in for Tony because I think it's a great organization worth endorsing if you have the time. But a little background on Tony, when he did end up coming back from training and uh, having had his Olympic dreams dashed, he did come to New York, he did get a job at the New York City Housing Authority and he struggled for a few years. And then he ended up becoming a part of the running culture in New York at that time and having to deal with being one of the few Latinos in that running culture and how with the value and the strength of having a mentor, a Irish American mentor, guide him and include him and encourage him to include even more Latinos to come and do running for the team, he was able to uh, help uh, uh, gauge that gap amongst uh, racial differences and discrimination that he had to deal with conflicts of being a minority within athletic groups and then uh, having to coach people who were once his rivals and uh, all these experiences about uh, confronting uh, economic poverty, having grown up in the projects in the Lower East Side, uh, in which he talks about further in his interview. Uh, he overcame so many obstacles, but then again, once he reached that level of success and worked hard for it, and now is one of the most in-demand coaches, uh, came up with uh, several techniques where uh, people who are training for the Olympics, people who are training for these worldwide marathons, they do refer to him, and he's quite a legend in those running circles. He's able to uh, want to give back, and again, that twist, that little note, like, you know, not being so self-absorbed, but wanting to give back, this theme keeps coming back again and again in ways that are small and large. Uh, I've been thinking about that a lot recently, and I mean, I checked out this uh, article in Slate Magazine, and if anybody has ever seen the Batman movies, you'll see, you know, uh, 
is anybody watching my do-gooding? It's like an analysis about uh, the, the roots of altruism. Why do people do it? Why do people, what prevents people or what it, it propels people to be heroes in life? And while it's more of like a little study about like, oh, do people do it for egomaniacal reasons or whatnot? I mean, I leave, I throw that question back to the audience, but in regards to the interviews and how that ties back to the 100 Puerto Ricans, I kept on seeing it and it was just too large of a thread to ignore this need, this desire, not just to uh, address a social injustice, but wanting to be an active part and being propelled and encouraged and inspired to do this. Uh, it, it really just stuck out for me. The last clip I want to share with you is uh, Reverend uh, Carmen Hernandez and a little bit about her background. So she, in her interview, she addressed some of her experiences as an advocacy act activist, including uh, who were her role models, um, she talks about her work to reach out to children in the community, and that's one of her main passions is dealing with the youth in her community in the Bronx and uh, the LGBT community. Uh, from a personal uh, viewpoint, she expresses how being a Christian, a lesbian, and a Latina woman has built her character and enriched her leadership to advocate for her community. And she talks about all of these uh, experiences, including, uh, well, that wasn't one of the clips that I included because it was it's pretty significant, but I didn't want to time. I know that there are other clips and other people who want to speak, but she does talk about being the first lesbian Latina to get married in the state of New York, and it's definitely worth listening to once you're able to get access to this interview to listen to it. In this clip, uh, she's discussing, again, when we were talking about this theme of social justice and activism, uh, she talks about the violence and discrimination against transgender individuals and the activities that she's participated to confront that kind of uh, discrimination. So. The news that's happening now, there's a rally that's been happening um, about the recent NATO, I think it was his name, um, that even in front of the police department, they, they killed him. Um, the guy beat him up to death and the police hasn't done their job. It's like, my God, we're human, we're a citizen, no matter who you are, wrong is wrong. And now the police is going around, they don't know where the guy lives that killed the kid because they didn't did their job. So, you know, that's a big issue that um, I'm working on with certain activists that brought it to my attention. And they're frustrated. They're frustrated because there's no justice um, for the transgender community. And I hope um, that people could, you know, be comfortable with it. Because in my time, the transgender was well, you know, well recognized. I remember Patsy, um, who used to be in our neighbor, and Patsy used to read my mother the cars back then. <laughs> Um, but Betsy was, everybody loved Betsy. You know, nobody felt, you know, I always remember, you know, her, you know, the transgender woman. Everybody accepted. I, I don't know why now they're getting so aggressive. I just don't get it, you know? It happened here a couple of years ago. We did. Um, I formed um, this organization that I call. I'm always doing something, but I call it the LGBTQS United as one. Um, I can send you the the video of it on a few website that they have it. Um, some news um, that they videotape it um, when we did the rally by Bainbridge by um, University um, um, that college. What they call it the the college by um, University. And she's talking about Bronx community, but it didn't occur to her at the time. But I'm going to probably pause it there because I don't want to take too much time. But again, like these notions of giving back, fighting back, sticking up for ones. And again, not a lot of financial resources. She works straight out of her apartment in the housing projects on, in Soundview, and she doesn't take a cent. And uh, the second part of her interview, I went to her home and I interviewed her in her home. And again, this wonderful, I. This culture of just like, you know, would you like a cup of coffee? Would you like a sandwich? Are you hungry? It's this warmth. It's this, is it something that's innate in people? Is it something that you're born with again? Is it something that happens to you late in life and then you're just like struck by kindness? Do you, is this something that can be encouraged? Is this something that's passed on or is this something that uh, has to be innate in you? Uh, and they're important questions, especially for our communities, Latino communities, because uh, we are we have in our culture I feel there is a very strong sense of that community building and giving back 
And uh, again, it, you don't have to change the world on one large leap, but it's the smaller actions that lead to the larger ones that I thought were really poignant. And we were um, asked to talk about preliminary findings for me uh, in regards to the archive and how it's much more community driven. That was one thing that attracted me very strongly to this project, the sense of the community defining what should be our archived and by the nominee process, people nominating within their own communities, we would seek these nominations not just by the uh, people at Central but also by people who knew people at Central saying, interview this person, this person's story is worth preserving and telling. And it's this self-driven uh, moment where everyone's an equal player and a participant in presenting their history to a larger mainstream audience that's just so important for those of us here who have previously worked at Central and for other organizations to take into account when we talk about what is an archive, what is its role in the community, how it's a gatekeeper to information, and kind of delineating. They're setting up the frame and telling you this is the part of history that counts. But with oral history, you do, this, do, do have this ability to frame it for yourself. And when you involve communities as active participants in documenting that history, that also kind of has that engaging effect, that community effect, which I think is very powerful. And uh, in regards to community-based archives, how it serves as an alternative venue for communities to make collective decisions about what's of enduring value historically for you, politically for you as a community. You don't have some uh, expert telling you what's worthy. You pass it on to your community members. So that, that to me was pretty much what stood out for me in regards to experience and reflections. I think it's just presenting the simple truth to people uh, and by these first-hand accounts that they're very powerful in and of themselves. And I think that one of the main missions of this project was to break apart those stigmas about what people think when you say that word Puerto Rican or any kind of Latino. What do people think when they hear those words? And then when they're confronted with these stories of uh, the same kind of uh, struggles that they deal with are the same struggles that you deal with. And you may or may not be Puerto Rican, and you may or may not be white or black, and you still deal with these same struggles. And finding that commonality amongst people, I think that oral history, other than just that uh, ability to document in an alternative format that may not be official, it may not be written, uh, is still a witness account. But also, it, it builds community, it builds dialogue. So uh, I'll just end with that. Thank you. Um, my name is Shakti Castro. I am the current oral history project coordinator. And I came to this project after working at Centro for about a year as a research assistant. I come from a literature background. I'm very interested in storytelling and in how we as Puerto Ricans, as people in communities that are not often seen as people who have stories that are worth telling, how do we take control of the narrative? And um, I don't know if any of you have followed something called the We Need Diverse Books campaign, which was recently all over Tumblr and Twitter and on the internet. It's talking about how the publishing world is so lacking in diversity. We don't have enough voices of color. We don't have enough disabled voices. We don't have enough queer voices. So for someone who comes from this background of literature, who is a teller of stories, who likes to think of themselves as a facilitator of the telling of stories, which is what I, I think my role is here at Centro is to help in the telling of stories. You know, being a part of an oral history project like this is particularly exciting for me. Um, what I've learned from working on the project is to have a sense of community as someone who is mixed, who is Puerto Rican and not Puerto Rican, meeting all of these people whose work that I've admired for so long, whose work in this field, particularly of getting our histories out there, has been really humbling to me to meet these people and to form relationships with them. And it's probably the best part of this project is to add to this incredible archive that when I was in high school, I didn't even know existed. It really took coming to Hunter and being a student and learning about what Centro does and how powerful it is and how this is such a varied community and so many people have different voices and they're all worth hearing. And in sort of light of that, the first clip I'd like to present is Virginia Sanchez Corol, who is an amazingly important Puerto Rican historian who's helped to document this community and who wrote a seminal text called From Colonia to Community. And this is her talking about the challenges of working on this, which is her dissertation. So I'm gonna see if this will pull up. Let's see. Thank you. 
book from going in to community. It's a seminal text in the field of urban studies. I want you to talk some about what the process of writing was like for you and what your reaction to its reception. Well, the process of writing going into community was br brutal. I think I threw the manuscript in the garbage can about four times. It was my doctoral dissertation, and I had never written a book before, and I had never done any publishing. Actually, I had never published anything before. I had given some papers at conferences, but uh, I had never. I had to write this book because I had to complete my doctoral, this my doctoral thesis. This was my doctoral thesis. And I also had to write the book because that was the reason why I went to graduate school in the first place. I wanted to be able to tell the story of the Puerto Rican community to my children because I was sure that that community would no longer exist by the time they became young women. And particularly since they were uh, Puerto Rican and uh, Russian Jewish by birth, uh, I knew that they had several, several uh, heritages to deal with, and I wanted to make sure that this one was not lost. And so I was determined that this was the story that I was going to tell. I entered Stony Brook on the condition that I would be able to study the Puerto Rican, uh, then we weren't even calling it the diaspora but to study the Puerto Rican diaspora and to be able to do some meaningful work on it. They accepted me, even though there was no one there that could actually guide my work, but they were very supportive, and, uh, and uh, I began to work with uh, Centro, the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, it was just beginning, and I became a research assistant with the Centro so that I could have access to the materials, and so that I could work with Dr. Frank Bonilla, who was the director and who was an expert in the field. Um, as I began to, uh, to put the story together from Colonia to community, I was remembering the community that I knew when I was growing up in the South Bronx and later on in Brooklyn, but mostly in the South Bronx, because that was, those were my formative years. And uh, my family was an extended family, we were very close. And again, this was the story that I wanted to convey to younger generations. And as I began to put the book together, I found that there was really nothing that had been written of the, in, of the, in the depth that I wanted to, to tell the story. I knew that although I had had personal experiences that I could relate to, that wasn't a scholarly book, so I needed to do sound research so that no one would laugh me out of the academy after this book was completed. And, uh, and it was through Centro that I began to find the tools to tell that story. So that was a very exciting interview for me to do, to sit down with Virginia after having used her book for my own research at Centro. Sorry, I'm never very good with mics. Um, so sitting down with Virginia and seeing how she sat down to write this book and what the meaning of it was for her, how she needed to get this history down. It was about preserving history. It was about telling a story, particularly for her own daughters, who are also mixed, and how this is such a new path to blaze, and how important that was. That was really exciting for me to sit down with her and see that this is a history that does have a place in the academy, even though increasingly ethnic studies programs are being underfunded and cut there is a place for these stories, and it's both inside and outside of academia. In that sort of vein, I'd like to introduce the next clip that I'm going to use, which is an interview that I did with Carmen Dinos, who was suggested to me by another 100 Puerto Ricans interviewee, Dr. Luis Reyes, who is here tonight, who also works at the Centro. Carmen Dinos is a pioneer in the field of bilingual education. 
which was so important when there were waves of Puerto Ricans coming to the city to have the right educational tools to help them address their needs in both languages. And here's her speaking about her work training bilingual and culturally competent teachers to help serve the growing Puerto Rican population in New York. And I wanted her to talk a little about what were the challenges that she faced in dealing with this subset of people of color during such a extreme civil rights movement, during such an intense period of our country's history. About your time as the director of the New York City Board of Education Program of Recruitment and Training, and you were working and training Spanish speaking teachers. Mm -hmm. um, if you could tell us about any challenges that you faced doing this sort of work in the midst of the civil rights movement, and any hurdles you had to jump over, even pertaining to funding or just general support of the public for training teachers? In the training of teachers in itself, uh, it, it isn't that it was problem free, but by that time, uh, it was a necessity. The board had to have the programs. You see, the, availabi the availability of funds made it easy to recruit and train, because by this time, the districts had uh, written proposals and gotten funds to develop the bilingual programs. So unless they got the teachers, they wouldn't get the funds. So all of a sudden, it was easy. What had be, been very difficult was before them to, uh, to get the board to really look at the needs of the Puerto Rican children and not to see those needs as a Puerto Rican problem, but rather than a problem that Puerto Rican kids were confronting when they went to school. So the hard time was to get the board to move towards the implementation of programs and services that took into uh, account the needs of the kids and tried to solve them. Once that was done and negotiating uh, programs and issues, that was a problem. And, uh, but along with the other groups of the other uh, people involved in civil rights, uh, it was, it was a, a formidable group that was uh, uh, advocating for the same thing. Uh, it was no longer just the Puerto Rican, but it was the Puerto Rican uh, representative along with the, the NAACP, the core, the Jewish, uh, all the Jewish uh, uh, organization that helped a lot in this and trained us in, 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 the, in the fight. Without that group working together, it would have been very, very uh, difficult. It was those years were the ones that were building. Okay, these people want this, let's give it to them, let's have them work it out, and it'll be all right. So uh, it was the years of building, of doing things uh, not as it is today that today we have lost a lot of what we gain, and now it's a matter of rebuilding in, in an atmosphere that is not friendly to one of these. At that time, with the civil rights movement, people were ready to give the right to the groups to do things by themselves. Speaking of forming relationships, interviewing Carmen was such a great day. I drove out there with one of my colleagues, Melissa, who's not here tonight, and she she called us while we were on the road. We're like, we're running late. And she's like, okay, did you guys eat yet? And we're like, no. She goes, well, I don't have much, but I'll, I'll put something together. And we get there, and there's a full spread for lunch. And we sit down, and we, you know, bojinje, we eat. And then we have coffee, and then we film for two hours, and then we have ice cream and more chat. And it's it's so exciting. People have shown us so much uh, 
hospitality. And it really is about forming a relationship with these people and with this community. It's not about, let's just get in and get this interview or let's just get your papers. It's really about the relationship now and going forward and what it means to have this almost sacred charge of these stories and of these documents. What does it mean for the future of our community, for future researchers who are both formal and informal scholars of this history? So it was just great to sit down with her and to listen to her talk. Um, and my theme for these clips, and I'm moving on to another one in a moment, was Puerto Rican women in education. It's not easy to be a person of color in the academy. It's not easy to be a Puerto Rican in education, especially fighting to get recognition for Puerto Rican studies. And learning from these women who've done such important work has been particularly rewarding for me as a Puerto Rican woman and future scholar. So I'd like to move on to Alma Ruba Lopez, who is a professor in the Brooklyn College School of Education and co-author of the book on becoming New Yorkans. And this is sort of a funny story of how she stumbled into her field of sociology. And I had a ball. It was fabulous. And I had a great time and great um, period. And coming back, I was almost in my senior year. And I said, what am I going to do? I have to apply. I have to register. So I called up my sister, and she was married to a man who was doing graduate work at Hunter. And I said to him, can you please register me for a major? For something, I have to take, I have to complete school. And he said, well, what do you want to major in? I said, well, it's either history or sociology. Either one, I had taken it back, I had taken like, nine credits of each, and I like both. So I said, he said, either one? I said, yeah, do not register me for Niksha. Either get me 12 credits of history or 12 credits of sociology, and that would be my major. And he couldn't get the history, so he got me the sociology, and I majored in sociology. And that's how I majored that. I had a clue as to what, I wanted to go into law. Originally, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a lawyer. I was not sure. I was very unclear about what I wanted to do. I just knew that I just wanted to get a college degree and finish. And at the time, a college degree meant something. So you could graduate in a liberal arts and get a job and do something with it. Unlike today, where young people have to really think about what they want to major in if they want to get a job after. I knew that I would find a job. Everybody had a job in the Department of Welfare. If you graduated, with a BA degree, it did not matter in what subject. It was really kind of scraping the barrel, but if you could not find any other job, the Department of Welfare would get would hire you as a caseworker, starting at $7,200 a year, $7,600, something like that, per year. So I knew that if worse came to worse, I would have a job in the welfare. Somehow, I would find a job there. So that's how I got my major. I, it was, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> So many Latino students, you know. Um, it was great. It was a great experience, and I was enrolled in all these Puerto Rican studies courses. So I had his Puerto Rican history one, one semester Puerto Rican history two. I had um, I had um, Cela Bonilla, 
uh, two semesters in the sociological anthropological um, course. I had Santeya, uh, Santeya one semester in a language course. I had, and it was, it was African and Puerto Rican studies. So I took with Henry Clark, who who is who was a great African American historian. I had him. I had great teachers, great professors. It was, um, I was so interested in learning about areas that I had really never academically learned about. It was, it was fabulous for me. It's the idea of sitting down and listening to Henry Clark, for example, about slavery, about the, the um, the transported of slaves from Africa to the United States, and um, and listening to Dr. Sela Bonilla talk about his uh, views about what is a Puerto Rican and what makes a Puerto Rican. Can you be a Puerto Rican and not know the language, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And the way he saw it from an anthropological perspective, and these were. Of course, there's a lot more to go on in that interview. And I like this one because it starts off really comedically, and she's like, I didn't know what I was going to do for college. You know, who knows? And she's like, whatever, just register me for whatever. I'll figure it out. At least I'll have a job when I graduate. And she stumbles into Puerto Rican and Black Studies, and she finds her calling, and she goes on to become a very serious scholar and the author of a great book called On Becoming New Eurekans. And it sort of brings this subject back full circle to the importance of these studies and why these studies programs exist and why an archive like Centro is necessary to begin with. And how for us as Latinos or Puerto Ricans more specifically, what it means for us to discover these histories that are so often denied to us. So that's the end of my part. Um, I'm gonna show a couple, or you can go ahead. So Sarah Molinari was my research partner on this project, and she's running a little late tonight. She's a graduate student. So I'd like to share some of her clips so we can also talk about those when she gets here in a little bit. <clears throat> and for Sarah, she picked clips that had to do with El Barrio, which also brings the subject back to the use of oral history as both an academic tool and one for community building. And El Barrio is such a hugely important place in the Puerto Rican cultural imaginary that it was really important for her to focus in on that. So from education to community. Let me pick one of these. And this is a clip of Marina Ortiz of East Harlem Preservation and Virtual Boricua, who does community organizing and historical preservation work in East Harlem. I'm sorry, I'm terrible with this mic. I think. Yes, yeah. So, so um, the East Holland Preservation um, Organization, as I said, came about through my work with East Harlem Historical Organization, the political activism, and how it started really was a web page that I created to highlight one issue going on in the community because I had done websites um, for my regular work, day jobs. And so um, that kind of one page blossomed into a whole bunch of different pages based on different issues of concern in the community. And Virtual Boricua was um, uh, a separate website that was created to honor Richie Perez and Pedro Pietri, who were um, people that I'd always looked up to, Richie Perez, in terms of political activism, social justice at Pedro Piedra in terms of the cultural work um, and specifically the New Rican identity, which I was, you know, that was instrumental in my personal development. As I said, he was one of my mentors and his kind of work really spoke to my identity um, as a New Rican and why do we call ourselves Puerto Rican? Why do we insist that, you know, 
you're Puerto Rican, you're born and raised here. And so his work and the kind of work that I did spoke to that. So they were very important people in my life. And when they died one month apart, there was nothing on the web to honor them. Um, there were articles here and there, but there was they had no, no websites. So I just created pages for them, and that kind of more has morphed into page after page after page dedicated to either Puerto Rican people, um, leaders, cultural icons, or news um, events. And East Harlem Preservation then kind of became so. Virtual Wedding Grads continued to be a a web. Um, and then East Harlem Preservation kind of became an official 501c3, working with um, different people in the neighborhood to, um, you know, fight against gentrification, but also to promote and preserve our um, our landmarks, our arts of work. And so then, when the spirit of East Harlem was vandalized, that became a campaign that we took on East Harlem Preservation. And also, um, I did work with Hope Community. So when there was, you know, the issue of money, funds to restore it, Manny Vega was first of all absolutely ready to go to restore it. And so I did what I always do, which is to make a lot of noise. And usually that gets the attention of some of the um, more progressive journalists. So David Gonzalez came on board and did a. Um, a uh, cover page for the metro section, a cover article for the metro section, and then so we were able to get funding. So that attention got us funding, and we um, commissioned Manny Vega to restore the mural, and so far it has not been <laughs> touched. And I'm gonna, um, same thing with the Juliana Wood. And that right there. So let's now open the floor for uh, questions and or, or comments. Anybody? Please. <laughs> I, I just want stories that reflect and embed that story in real life. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if maybe you want to stand close here and you want so you can come and react to so I really envision this as a an informal discussion. So you know, smile and interact with me <laughs> and laugh and enjoy this, please. Um, that is one of the most exciting things for me to see this sort of history brought to life. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's a very famous oral historian who I discovered doing this work, who an Italian oral historian, Alessandro Portelli, mm -hmm. who says that oral history is not about fact, and, and Cynthia brought this up earlier, oral history is about meaning. How do we experience these events? And I can tell you that there have been times when people have not told me the truth, or they've fudged things, and I don't think it's a malicious intent to deceive so much as it's just how they remember history, how things felt to them, and sort of connecting these personal stories that illustrate the data, that illustrate the more historical, factual elements of the history is exactly what Louis said, it's compelling and it's worthwhile and it's what's necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yes, I, I mean, we need the documents, uh, but also we need the testimonies, how people feel, uh, feel have felt if the events. Uh, and uh, I, uh, an academic historian just doing uh, research on Puerto Ricans using newspapers are not going to get this uh, kinds of uh, stories. Yes? Um, I noticed one of the um, themes sort of running through the videos we were shown was um, these women talking about how in their experience it was sort of a, a really good time for developing um, the kinds of things that, that were important to them, that uh, the civil rights movement allowed for development of bilingual education and you were able to transition working cultural studies into dancing and blending and things like that. And the sort of unfortunate thing is it seemed like they were saying, well, that stuff was a lot easier back then and there are a lot of challenges now 
um, that, are, that are making this kind of thing difficult. And I wonder if you can speak to how um, co uh, compiling these kinds of oral histories might help to um, you know, uh, counteract some of the current difficulties uh, that people face. I'd like to pose a question to you, actually, with your experience at the Baltimore and the Michigan. I don't know if you want to get up. You don't have a table mic, so it's either shout from here or get up there. Talk really loud. Um, uh, maybe, check thing. Maybe yeah. you want to stay here. <laughs> and, so you don't have to go back. You don't have to go back. Well, I think we, we all have our own uh, way of perceiving or wrapping our minds around it. I think. For me, I guess, in regards to the question, mm, I, I, feel, I feel like for me, and especially with my research and the type of projects that I'm really interested in documenting, it's, it's more important not just to have a static archive of an interview and a story on a website or on YouTube and you clicked it and it's like, oh great, it's there for posterity, but it collects digital dust. There's nothing that will compel anyone to do anything with it unless uh, people start to get creative. And uh, I feel that listening parties, I feel like events such as this one where people are engaged around a topic, although it is still a little scholarly, but I mean, Shakti's done a great job about making this fun, making this compelling, making this more of an informal conversation, because that's where it starts to break down those stereotypes. Because I feel like the, one of the main driving forces behind this project was to break down the stereotypes, break down these images, these uh, perceived notions, these prejudices that we all carry around when we see somebody, uh, when we see a professor, what we think of them, when we uh, interact with our coworkers or our colleagues or whoever, we all carry around these things inside us. But uh, when you're confronted with a real life narrative story, it's pretty hard to uh, carry that thought through. You, you, you're, you're confronted with the truth, and it's a simple truth. That simplicity is very important. And how do you key that into something as important as activism? What will compel people to action? You know, I was uh, participating in a conference just a few weeks ago where I met a number of uh, activists who were doing this and uh, combining uh, oral history in, in very uh, different ways. These ideas of story circles, for instance, are very popular amongst uh, people who are documenting stories. NYPL, they're doing a very uh, interesting uh, documentary oral history project where they're uh, soliciting interviewers from the neighborhoods themselves to do the interviews. They'll give them a one-day training, and uh, I totally encourage people to Google that if you, uh, you have an NYPL branch in your neighborhood in Harlem, in the Bronx. I know that they've been doing a lot of work in East Harlem, too, and Jefferson Market, where it started. It's a great project. But then compelling people to come around and to define the notions for themselves. And I think that's, that, for me, is the interesting part of it. It's not necessarily having some expert uh, historian tell you what you should be looking out for, but you saying the parameters for it. And I think that even though it may not be officially oral history, things like StoryCorps, things uh, that you see on uh, national public radio, it's starting to propel that notion. And, and people are doing it regardless and not even considering that it's oral history and they're doing it anyway. With social media, you have Twitter, you have all these venues that people are doing where you, you videotape an injustice happening, this document, documentary activist zeal that people have. And without even realizing that that's what they're doing. So, I mean, I hope that kind of answered the question a little bit. I guess, uh, did I overlook anything? Yeah. More questions? Comments? Yes. Um, did you set a criteria on who you will interview and also um, how do you prioritize who is going to be interviewed first? Um, well, when we started the project two years ago, I know there was a, a push to honor certain people, and Centro had a series of events called Affinity Events to sort of bring people into this project, honor them, and get these agreements to give us oral histories and documents. So we do have listed people, and you know there are people who are always suggesting other people to interview. As far as priority, when we first started, it was just a huge list of names. And we sort of had free reign in the beginning of this process to sort of go through this list and think, well, you know, I'm really interested in poets or artists. I think I'd like to cover these people. 
or Sarah's an academic, she's an anthropologist, she really wanted to interview people in her field, people who she'd studied with, like Clara Rodriguez at Fordham University. I know it was important to you to interview Tony Ruiz through your own experience through running, and people who had also had experiences similar to the people you'd interviewed for the WRI, the Welfare yeah. Rights Initiative. So that was sort of our initial process, but now we're sort of tightening in and sort of seeing what are the gaps in Cephalus Collection? Who haven't we interviewed? Who is pushing 100 that we need to talk to before it's too late? So it's been a sort of combined process of not having a very strict criteria, besides Puerto Rican has done work in the community and sort of choosing who we get to highlight in this project. Mm -hmm. And then also, okay, what's necessary at this point? We have o over 85 interviews done. What's next? Uh, let me uh, just add uh, something. I, I think uh, I want to challenge Centro <laughs> uh, uh, to consider also interviewing people that are that we don't necessarily think of, of them as leaders, uh, such as someone that started as a law uh, em a worker in a factory and mm -hmm. became a supervisor uh, in that, uh, on a factory. Uh, Actually, we do have a couple of those interviews. Okay. Yeah, oh, we, okay. Do have, we do have normal everyday interviews. Henry okay. Dominguez was one. Okay. But I mean, uh, I, I feel with that. I think that ordinary yes. story, the ordinary mm -hmm. person also has a very mm -hmm. strong component to mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting, though, is that a lot of the people that were interviewed who have become leaders all had their starts as ordinary people. Mm -hmm. That was one theme within mm -hmm. the interviews that did mm -hmm. come up often. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that helps. No, no, yes. I, I mean, uh, I think that's important. Uh, when I was doing oral histories for Centro, I had uh, similar experiences, and my the project that I was doing about the his, Hispanic uh, Hispanics in the labor movement, and that have been <coughs> the same uh, similar, having the same shape that uh, Cynthia talked about about the formation of these uh, community leaders, and uh, nobody from what I know, nobody ha has written <coughs> about uh, an article about how a Puerto Rican community leader emerges. And uh, I think this oral histories and the other ones that have, that are in at Central Archives are uh, reflect this and, and can contribute to, to uh, such uh, write, writing. Uh, so we have uh, Sara Molinari, uh, PhD, a PhD uh, anthropology student at the Grado Center and former research assistant System at Centro. Mm -hmm. You wanna add some? Um, yeah, sure. Um, sorry, I'm I'm late. Um, I worked on the project with Shakti for two years, and also with Cynthia when she came, and it was a really amazing experience. Uh, I heard that we saw Marina's clip. I had a couple of of other of other ones to show, but um, one theme for me, and a, a theme that I picked out to show from these clips was place making, and, and the place specifically being El Barrio. El Barrio came up in a lot of our interviews in terms of history, in terms of migration, community struggle, arts, um, and that, that was kind of my, my theme that I wanted to address here in uh, the clips I chose. So if anyone has questions specifically about El Barrio, So 
from the population of the track. So it's important to be addition to go forward. So um, I had one question, okay, so I appreciate all of you for doing it. Today is my credit for my course. Um, they said the number 100, is it, somebody said about, is it age or is it the number of 100 number of people that you have interviewed? What's the specific number of 100? And I also wanted to know about blood borders and immigration. I think you're going to talk about that. Or, or you're going to basically talk about immigration. Well, yeah, that, that, that's certainly one of the themes that come up um, because a lot of the people we talk to uh, have migrated from Puerto Rico to to the States, to New York, wherever. We've interviewed people in a number of locations. I'm sure that's been addressed. Um, but just to go back to the, the number 100, as far as I understand it, it was, it was a target. And we, I think, quickly surpassed that in terms of people that wanted to donate collections, that wanted to do oral histories. So that was kind of a symbolic target um, yeah, yeah, for uh, to kind of tag along to Centro's anniversary. It was really cute. They had like a little meter thing, like you know, yeah. for each story. You know, we're fifty in. Or, you know, oh, it's okay. more like a. Yeah. Yeah, but we we have more, much more Way than that. More. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the oral histories that are completed are just a really small portion of the actual um, people that are going to be part of this project and that have signed up to be. Yes. I have a, a question basically in terms of next steps um, and how accessible will this project be for community? Um, because, or is it going to be more an academic kind of thing? Because I think the beauty of it uh, is that we need to get this out to our community uh, because it's part of the history, it's what grounds people in, in, in the history. And I, you know, so I'm really about how that's going to happen. I'll answer that question. Um, I think Dr. Melendez's vision for the project is a sort of push for Centro to enter the age of digital humanities and to present these oral histories as a completed package of a digital video and an online narrative and a guide to whatever documents eventually end up in the archives. I know for us, it has been very important for us to make this an accessible project. And when we give people consent forms, we tell them pieces of it might be online, it might be accessible to a broader audience, pieces of it might end up in promotional materials for Centro. So it's our sincere hope that this will be a publicly available project. And it will definitely be available in Centro's archives, which is free and open to the public. And we're located in East Harlem at 119th Street. But our final steps for the project, it's a little in the air. It's a little what's going to happen next. We're editing over 85 videos. We're adding metadata. We're th doing something called thematic time coding, which is a sort of precursor to transcribing to eventually say, well, what are these five minutes of this video about? And how can we incorporate them into the website? How do we present this as part of different areas of research? So it's an ongoing process. And uh, of course, as someone I've interviewed, Digna, Digna Sanchez. I will be keeping you in the loop, but that's the best answer that I can give you right now. Yes, Luis. Can I add to the answer? <clears throat> we uh, as recently as today going out to uh, Centro's thousands of uh, people on our distribution list is a uh, Voices, Voices, uh, which is an electronic newsletter which has a number of articles <coughs> that are, some of them are interviews of people, and one of them today, which I don't know was done by your team, but it's of David Gonzalez, the New York Times uh, photographer, photojournalist, and reporter talking about his work and his growing up as a New Yorker in, in the South Bronx. And so that goes out to the world. And the ability through social media, uh, I was able to send out uh, that section of voices uh, about David Gonzalez with photos that he's taken so that his work and his talking about his life together can be shared on Facebook and on LinkedIn to uh, people on my list and hopefully other people will do the same. 
The second thing is that we're also doing a series of uh, documentaries on Puerto Rican history in the U.S. And so the, a lot of the interviews will be very important. For example, in one series we're going to do about bilingual education and community control in New York, uh, Carmen Dinos and other people who you have interviewed, we will be able to use them in the documentary. You in the back. <laughs> as, as a documentary filmmaker myself, one of the things, and the reason I got into media was so many ethical things I saw wrong, like that other, others were doing, outside media, how bad their practices were, how unethical they were when talking about our communities. What were the biggest ethical challenges that you faced along this journey? Like the thing that you were like, I don't know how I feel about that, or just, if there were, if there were moments that that was part of your consciousness about, because you are taking people's stories, right? So if you could just think back, what were the ethical problems or questions that you had to confront um, throughout this process? I'm gonna pass this one over to Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, well, Hey, there's. I guess something I happened, right? No, no, no. I, I, I can't think of anything like specifically where I felt like I was in an ethical dilemma, uh, honestly. But um, there have been a couple instances in my case where, you know, we explained the consent agreement very thoroughly with um, with the people we're interviewing, the people that are participating in the project, and and there and you know, it, the point is to have a mutual understanding that. What they say in the interview is going to be part of Centro's collection. So, if you don't want to say a specific thing that could be publicly available, you know, keep it for some another time to say it. Um, so, yeah, some people have have shared, you know, really personal stories or personal struggles or conflicts they've had um, uh, with other people. So, I, I kind of hear these this like bochinche that you know. Uh, and, and I, you know, I remind people that this is going to be publicly available and all this stuff, and, and, and they understand that. So I, I wouldn't even say that's an ethical, it didn't become an ethical dilemma, <coughs> but I would say that the, um, the importance of mutually understanding the consent forms and um, what, what people say and the stories they want to tell are going to be publicly available. That, oh, oh, the, you, the duty of the interviewers uh, is to... Uh, make sure that no, nothing is gonna affect uh, the reputation of the uh, interviewee. Uh, but I guess, did you right. have that? Uh, we did, you know, we, gave, mm -hmm. we had people, um, a couple people have, have come back and said, you know what, I, I remember I don't want this to be in the interview, or there's a specific thing I said, I don't want it to be public. And, and we, we deal with that on kind of an a, a individual interview basis. Yeah. But just to like add to that, just mm -hmm. very like, Shakti had mentioned before the value of relationship building. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like we were strong arming people to sign consent forms and we did give them a lot of freedom and a lot of understanding. Just really take your time, read that form if you have any questions. And I think that's because, you know, Sarah and Shakti before have done such an excellent job building trust with the narrators and when there's that initial trust and that relationship building, it's not like we're, they're gonna take your interview and, and never see you again. It's a continual relationship. So the chances of dealing with ethical sticky issues uh, is lessened by that. Um, so I think they did a great job doing that. Yeah, I mean, being nice is the most important requirement well. to carry out. Uh, an oral but history. honest, you know, yeah, 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 honesty. Yeah. But yeah. you know, if yeah. you, you have to have a good relation, <laughs> establish a good relationship with the interviewee, if not, uh, and nothing. I mean, in, in other in other archives, they do have these practices where if somebody does come to your archive and requests to take something down, I mean, there are restrictions you can place. You can mm -hmm. do all sorts of things, mm -hmm. and I mean, you yeah. know, they have an excellent staff here at Central for Libraries and Archives, and they respect that. So. Questions, comments? No? So let's give them an applause. They have done an excellent uh, job with this auto history project. Thank you for coming.
Can I play it like just in the background? Oh, you want it? You want it? I mean, I, uh, she wants to add a, 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 a clip, so if you want to stay, uh, it, it, I mean, it, it mingle and please, um, you know, eat the food in the back. But uh, I know we only got to see one of one of my clips, but there's this one in particular that it's really, really beautiful um, that I, I wanted to share if we had some time. It, if you have to go, that's that's no problem. Um, this is Roger Caban. Um, he is an artist, educator. Uh, activist, uh, does a lot of work on housing in El Barrio, and, and I just wanted to share this part to kind of bring in like how important it is to collect these histories, because he's telling a really, uh, he's, tell, he's talking about El Barrio in a, at a very specific moment in the 1950s, and also he had, his father migrated in the 1920s, so he's, he's talking about this, what it was like demographically, what were the important places in El Barrio, and it, it's just a really, really beautiful clip. And what, who really was here, and what, you know. Well, like I said, I was born in Isabella. I told my father was born in Panama, and, and he was a New York Rican. Back then, he was raised in, in Harlem. In the, at the time, he was uh, uh, working in, uh, in construction, but uh, he was a heavy operator, uh, operator heavy equipment. He was with a company that evidently went to, had a contract and went to Puerto Rico. And uh, I guess back in 1941 or something, he was down there working, and he met my mother, and he married her, and he brought her here. I guess he was there for my first two years. And then uh, his, my mother and him uh, came back to New York, along with my grandmother, and followed by my aunt and her husband. And that's how I ended up at the age of two in, in El Barrio. And uh, like I said, it was very, very different then. I remember. 110th Street was predominantly Jewish. Uh, I remember the, 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 the what we call bodegas, so they were Jewish shops, and I remember seeing the Hebrew lettering on, on uh, all the shops. La Marqueta, uh, which, which you all know, it's gone now, but La Marqueta, the, the, the merchants were predominantly Jewish, Hasidic, Hasidic Jews, and, and uh, 116th Street from, from uh, uh, from Park Avenue to Lexington and down and around, that was all the city. You know, and and uh, La Marqueta was, like I said, most of the merchants uh, were Hasidim. It was The Marqueta was divided in half. One half, the east side of it, had dry goods, what they call dry goods, and haberdashery, pots and pans and stuff. And the other side was uh, produce and it, uh, vegetables and so stuff. And it started on 111th Street, and it went up to 115th Street, and then from 115th Street to 116th Street, that one last car was po poultry and fish. It was like a big, big fish market. And uh, it was an interesting place because it had a, a lot of street vendors besides the regular merchants that, 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 that were there. There were like, uh, there was one guy that had a pony. He was also a Hasidic. And he walked around with a pony and had a five by seven camera. And uh, everything, uh, people from my era, they all have that shot with the pony, you know? I have it somewhere in one of my boxes. And uh, there was a guy, there was a parrot that told fortunes. There was uh, Italian guys that played violins. Uh, La Marqueta was actually started in uh, around the 1930s by the mayor of Guardia. And it was designed to get the street merchants off the street, the guys with the push carts. So they got them all off the street and they built La Marqueta which was a series of cars that was under what was then called the uh, to Haven Railroad Line. I think today they call it North Central. And it was under, like I said, from 111th Street to 116th Street. And there's talk of, of bringing the Marqueta back, you know? It was a very exciting place. Uh, to, me, to me, it was a place where the world met because all these people from pilgrims from faraway lands like Connecticut and New Jersey, and when I say people were talking about the Hispanics, mostly Puerto Ricans, would come from Connecticut, from New Jersey, to the Marqueta, that's where they could get all, all the, the related Puerto Rican uh, food products and, and, and stuff that came from the island. They even sold sugar cane. As a kid, I used to sell shopping bags there. Uh, there was a place on the Street where I would go there and I'd buy a shopping bag. If I had a nickel, I would buy two shopping bags that were two cents a piece. And I would go 
when I get that song to nickel got a dime, then I went back there, and I, with that dime, I brought five of them. And I worked my way up. By the time at the end of the day, my pockets were bulging with coins, and I would go home. I had a fortune, you know, probably maybe four or five dollars, but it felt like like a fortune, you know. Selling shopping bags there, and, and uh, it was just an exciting place, and like, you know, it was magical. You know, my grandmother used to buy this big bar of butter, and it was a big block, and it was white. And then inside the package, there was a little package of coloring. And then she would stand, spend about an hour churning this white butter with this, with this dye to turn it yellow. And I thought, uh, as a child, she was actually making the butter. You know, and she was just giving it color. And, uh, you know, it was just a, an exciting place. The whole neighborhood, uh, in the summer, you had the same uh, merchant would come around the streets of violin players, they would serenade the tenants and they would throw kind coins and, uh, and most of the the, uh, the things that, that they sold were on horse-drawn wagons that would come around, guys selling watermelon, they would sell little baby chicks for some reason before they became criminal, you know, you could buy a little baby chicken for about a nickel, you know, I actually raised one home. Uh, I built it a box and I actually raised an item for months and months and it became like a real chicken and one day I came home and the chicken was gone and look at my grandmother told me it had uh, flown away and uh, little did I know that night I was having chicken soup and it was uh, a chicken, she never told me that I found out. Yeah, I, I just, I really wanted to share that um, because I think this is a, an example and this is this is also representative of a lot of the interviews we did. This is this kind of subjective rendering of history that you cannot, we cannot get from, this is from other sources like statistics or uh, things like this. This is firsthand daily life history. It's, it's beautiful, it's living, it's alive. And um, I think this, this was a, a, a good example of that. And, and the, the other kind of histories we've, we've uh, acquired. Thank you.